Buongiorno, grazie di essere qua, anche siamo già in diretta a streaming. È la terza giornata di questo incontro Ci vediamo in piazza, il terzo di tre workshop che abbiamo organizzato con Cervana e poi con Contropedale all'interno di Laboratori dal Basso e Principi Attivi, e puntato sull'illuminazione in spazi urbani. Abbiamo avuto già due incontri parlando di metodi per illuminare spazi urbani anche in maniera più alternativa o provocativa da un punto di vista artistico, architettonico, sociale e oggi abbiamo con noi Roger Narboni che è uno dei massimi esponenti del Latin Design a livello internazionale autore di molteplici master plan di illuminazione quindi un, uno dei grandi esperti, siamo molto onorati di averlo qua e, e ci, ci illustrerà un po' la, la sua esperienza alcuni casi di studio interessanti che ci possono ispirare e far apprendere Avremo una presentazione e poi aperti al dibattito per domande, questioni e, e qualunque cosa vogliate, vogliate chiedere. E prima del programma della mattinata, poi vedremo Alberto Barbera e Irene Bass, il nostro istituto del workshop, che ci illustreranno anche dei progetti svolti con l'Upercales. E poi oggi sarà giornata intensissima di montaggio e prove per la festa di stasera. Grazie. Sulla parola a Roger. Allora, è fine di un servizio ottimale. E chi è che non conosce l'inglese? Chi non capisce l'inglese? Solo tu. Tutti voi comprendete l'inglese? Quindi se parla direttamente l'inglese siete tranquilli. Mm? Perché se è così velocizziamo, vabbè, se sono uno o due per velocizzare, per rendere tutto più scorrevole, tanto in streaming va comunque l'interpretariato, io mi siedo vicino a voi due che avete bisogno e vado in sussurrato in simultanea, così il laboratorio risulta più scorrevole per tutti eh, e io interpreto solo per voi, se siete tutti a posto così, ok? Poi se avete bisogno c'è qualcosa che non comprendete, o, insomma, per, facciamo così allora. Okay. <ride> Alzate la mano e io, quindi mi siedo dietro vicino a voi. Ok, so. Let's go. Anyway, it's not going to be very technical, so I'm sure everyone will understand. So, um, How I organize uh, this, uh, this lecture is, I, I will show you some projects uh, that we did in the last uh, 26 years already because uh, the studio was created in 1988, just to give an idea of what we're going, uh, what we're doing usually. And then um, I, I have tried to, to construct this lecture in order to, to think and debate with you what is uh, night identity or what is nocturnal identity. Uh, we, have, we had the chance to work abroad for about now seven years in many, many countries, as you will see, and in many, many different occasions, sometimes with partnership, local partnership, sometimes uh, without local partnership. And working on this um, lecture, I, uh, I thought that it would be interesting to, to try to point out uh, when a lighting designer work on a country or in a country, what is a part of um, his own identity and culture he, br he is bringing with him and what is a part of identity and local culture is trying to express or to, to visualize or to translate in a way. And, and I think it's something very difficult to, to express because in some projects, as you will see, um, in a way or another, we reach uh, uh, to, to express a local identity. In some other project, I think we, we did not uh, realize this, um, this achievement. And then I was thinking of uh, what is local identity? I mean, we are in a global world and uh, we have a lot of, um, of uh, techniques that are really worldwide now. Uh, technologies, fixtures, uh, images, uh, trends. And, um, and sometimes people uh, that ask uh, someone to work with, uh, with 
uh, a city or on a project, they want this international vision as well. So this is quite complicated. So if you agree, uh, after I, I will show you all that, I would be very happy to talk with you and debate with you about uh, all these issues because I'm not sure there is a truth or there is a, a whatever a reality into that. And I think it's important to that everyone try to make his own idea about it and that we could discuss what as lighting designer or which responsibility as lighting designer we have to, to build something toward local identity and local cultures. Okay, and we'll make a pause whenever we feel like making a pause. So if you are tired enough, we can make a pause because there's quite a lot of slides, so. <laughs> okay, so this is our studio. We started in 1988, uh, we are eight person all together. Well, some of them have changed uh, from time to time. But more or less, we have the same size and same structure. And, uh, and uh, well, this is a studio life. So I, I won't explain every project because uh, it's not uh, the point. Um, I just wanted with, through uh, some projects, show you how we, we evolute and we change also from time to time. We change because of the evolution of, uh, of the demand, the evolution of the technology as well, but also because of um, um, how we build ourselves into project and how we, we wanted to, to construct this concept and how we wanted to evolve into this concept. This is the first project we did. It's a very uh, nice project for us because that was the one we, we started with. We started the first study in 1988, and um, the, the demand was to uh, make a lighting project into a river in the city of Niort, which is a very small city in France. It's 40,000 people living there. It's not a big city. And the mayor wanted to create something fairy, as he said, at night because the river was really dark and really sad at night without any possibility to go on the banks and to, to walk because everything was uh, dark and not very attractive. And he wanted to change that. This river is just in the middle and in the center of the city. He wanted to change that. So he asked us if we could build um, a, a lighting um, project but will in a way or another attract people and make uh, the river different at night. It was very interesting because we did not have a program, we did not have any, any constraints, nothing about light pollution, nothing about biodiversity, nothing about energy saving, no f even budget, budget issue was not the point because we did not know how much that could cost and he said, well, let's do the project, we'll see. So we, we made a study on one kilometer long of the river and then we realized 600 meters in three years we work a lot with the technician from the city. They, they build the project, they install the project. We had even the help of the firemen to put the fixture underwater. So all this was really interesting because um, we had to, to learn how to work on a, this kind of project. We have to build everything, to design every, project, every product. There was not a single fixture we couldn't find in the catalog. And well, uh, more or less, we, we achieved uh, what we wanted. Uh, we discussed with um, the people living there. They, they expressed themselves about the project and the color and uh, the concept. And we changed things because some, some colors were too strong for them. At, at that period, for sure, we were not using LEDs. We were using uh, halogen lamps, very consuming lamps, and we had to put filters. And well, it well, was very interesting because we had to construct um, our own techniques. But we, we finalized it, and uh, for us, it was a start. It's with this project that we really started the, the studio. Because when we finished it in 1992, four years after starting the first design, uh, it has been published everywhere in France and we, we get a lot of demands from uh, over cities, many demands for rivers <laughs> at the beginning. <laughs> Everyone wanted to make the same kind of project with this water lily. We call them luminous water lilies and uh, luminous um, vegetation and luminous trunk and luminous stones and 
and everyone wanted the same. So uh, I think it would be interesting when uh, I will go through some other project later on, but to, to try to understand as well how things uh, has changed now in terms of budget, in terms of uh, environment, in terms of biodiversity, even in terms of uh, communication and consultation. And I'm sure, unfortunately, uh, it would be impossible to make a project like that now because, uh, well, the demand is not the same at all. The, the mayors are not anymore asking someone to do a fairy approach or a creative approach on this kind of project. And um, because when we started that, the mayor say, well, let me dream. Uh, I, I don't have anything else to tell you. Just let me dream with this project. So now, really, when we meet mayors, they don't ask us to let them dream. So this is, well, I think it's, uh, it's one age and a period that is unfortunately behind us. But at least it helped us really to start it what we wanted to start and to achieve, uh, in a way, a, a strategy to develop what we call nightscape or, or nocturnal lightscape. The second project uh, that we were very, very important for us was a project with an Italian architect, Italo Rota, that's still working in Milano. And it was a public space. And in France, this was the first time for um, a public space where uh, from the very beginning of the competition, the competition was in 1991, from the very beginning of the competition, uh, a lighting designer was integrated into the team with an architect and a landscape architect and an engineer. And uh, well, we, we design all together the, the daytime image, the nighttime image, and uh, we won this competition and we, we had the chance to realize this project on one kilometer long uh, avenue. In, there was um, a tramway line project and uh, we could develop uh, the lighting specifically along this tramway line. So uh, we designed all the fixtures and all the, the lighting poles because again, there was nothing into the catalogs to that fulfill our expectations. And the mayor was really supporting us to, to design new things and to design new products with new technology. We had to, to invent um, uh, optical fibers into the poles to create the effect we wanted. We, we spent a lot of time of making research and development to really uh, get what we wanted on these lighting poles. Uh, we had new lamps at that period. It was called uh, white sodium. I don't know if some of you have, have heard of white sodium. It doesn't exist anymore in, into the public space. So all this was again uh, really revolutionary in, in terms of uh, working with the city technician and working with the mayor. And it was a, a, a very good start in France for this profession of lighting design because since this competition, many, many competitions have been integrated a lighting designer into uh, the team of, um, in charge of the competition. And nowadays in France, when you, when you see all big competition about um, renewing public spaces, they ask for a lighting designer integrated into the team. So it was also very important for the profession in, in France. Well, we, we work on many, many projects, so I won't explain everything. We, we try to use uh, light to create ambiences, to transform space. This is a tunnel in concrete that lead to um, a movie theater. So it was gray and really ugly. And uh, the architect asked us if we could uh, create something. So we, we propose him to build this wall of, um, of glass um, and we play with colored light behind it and we transform totally uh, this transition between uh, the outdoor space and inside the movie theater. Um, we worked on darkness very, very early. Uh, we, we were in charge of uh, the lighting master plan of the city center of Athens. It was just before the Olympic Games. We were preparing the Olympic Games in 2004. And um, they, they create a special company to um, re redevelop and renew most of the public spaces of Hatton city center. And there was like 54 team of architects working on different squares and avenue and, and 
and promenades and, and parks and gardens. And they wanted someone to coordinate all that. So they launched this uh, idea of doing a light semester plan. And we, we were in charge. But that was not a competition. They asked us directly to work with them. And we were in charge to coordinate all these 54 teams and on, on the night ambiences and the night images. And especially for this avenue that is just um, at the bottom of the Acropolis, that was um, an avenue with cars and they decided to make it totally pedestrian. We proposed a, a dark concept with two thirds of the avenue. It's an avenue that is almost 40 meters large. We proposed to have a dark concept on two thirds of the avenue and a very bright uh, lighting on one further of the avenue. And uh, well, everyone was against that, the, the municipalities, the technicians, the authority. They thought it won't be possible to keep this darkness into the inner center. And well, we made a try. Like very often, uh, we try to make try because uh, that's the best way to convince people that what you propose is uh, interesting or not. Sometimes, even um, if we don't succeed to convince people, you can transform things with the people. And uh, well, when we made a try, we made a try on, on 100 meter and people really appreciate the darkness because on the right side of the image, you could see the Acropolis totally in a dark environment and the Acropolis and the Parthenon is illuminated brightly. So the contrast was really good. And as you can see, well, many, many people prefer darkness. And for us, it was really a very interesting lesson because uh, since then we have been developing a lot of projects with darkness and uh, making darkness master plan and making what we call now dark infrastructure. And, um, and I really think that, again, one of our responsibility, and we can talk about that as well, talking of uh, project abroad, is to, to promote this idea of darkness and to promote um, a, a strategy to balance darkness and lighting into cities, into urban environment, and for sure into natural and, and very sensible environment. And again, we could talk about that later on if you wish. Uh, at the same time, we did this bridge that was also uh, inaugurated with the Olympic um, Games in 2004. Uh, it was a huge bridge of 2.5 kilometers long. The difficulty was that um, uh, they asked us to light the bridge so we could see it at 10 kilometers away from all the touristical uh, cities that were around um, the bridge and near Patras, which is one of the biggest cities of uh, Greece in the Peloponnese. And um, we had to achieve that uh, possibility of uh, very far vision and also uh, because the bridge can can be walked by pedestrian they ask us to have no glare and no no perturbation for any pedestrian walking on the bridge so we had really to to manage and um, to master the contrast and the, the power of uh, the lamps and where the fixture will be put in order to illuminate brightly enough the structure to be seen from very, very far away and also to keep a very good comfort on a, on a very close vision. We work on different aspects. Now in France we have the chance to, that lighting designer can, can work on many, many different projects, um, industrial projects, transportation projects, infrastructure projects. Uh, well, public space and for sure also architectural projects and museums and commercial center, this is more, more frequent. But um, we really also uh, are asked fortunately enough to work on projects like tramway line that has very often long projects. It's some from seven kilometers to 13, 14 kilometers long. So the, the role and um, uh, I would say the, the need of the lighting designer is really to understand this, uh, this uh, very coherent um, trajectory that cross the city and as well to, to propose and to promote sequences and, and diversity and, uh, and not having a very uniform project on a very, lo very long uh, trajectory crossing the city. So lighting designer is really, really important into this project. And there is a lot of tramway lines that are being built in, in France, and we are also making one in Switzerland um, right now. So for us, it's an important project because we can um, see how lighting can 
give an identity to a tramway line, but also okay. how this um, lighting could uh, make interchange and dialogues between the tramway line and the urban form or the urban environment. Uh, this is a project we really un enjoyed to do because it was at the beginning no one believed into this project everyone said this is impossible you won't be able to put a, a line of flight into the bed of the river it's inside the garonne river it's a very very strong river that goes through uh, toulouse uh, that was the first time we used the technology of leds we had to develop products specifically for this uh, we have to be very, very good in, in energy efficiency. We con consuming was only 900 watts for a very, very long luminous line. And uh, well, we, we, we spent a lot of time to convince everyone that this could be possible. Even the municipal authority did not believe into the project. Uh, the engineers did not believe into the project. The manufacturers did not believe into the possibility of creating products. And we had to fight and to be very obstinate. And I think it's one of the very important thing about being a lighting designer is being as obstinate as you can be. Because sometimes no one will never believe what you're saying and what you're talking about. And uh, well, if you are not obstinate enough, everyone will win and you will lose the fight. So it took us two years to do this project. Uh, unfortunately, we got a new law in France that's called the water law. That's a law that is related with uh, uh, rivers and lakes and and you had to make a special study to to study uh, the biological impact of the lighting you have to convince all the fishermen that there will be no harm for fishes going into the rivers you have uh, to uh, try to understand as much as possible what would be the effects of the lighting for the biodiversity uh, in terms of uh, fish, birds, plants and everything. So it took us a year to make all these studies with biologists and uh, to decide what color could be the best uh, choice. But again, we learned a lot with this project and if we did after some of the projects we did in China, I will show you them later on, it's because we made this project and we succeed to realize it. We did a lot of monuments. We had the chance to work on very, very nice and, and beautiful monuments, such as this cathedral of France. Uh, we always try to, to develop projects in, in, in terms of mm, no uniformity or no single approach on all the facades. Uh, the classical way of doing your lighting on a monument in France was to, to lead some monument with a lot of, of light with a lot of flux, luminous flux, and um, we wanted to try to show it differently, to, to focus on some aspect of the monument and to take into the darkness some other aspects, so to get more contrast, more, I would say, um, painting effect, not having um, a big uh, wash of lighting on a monument. And uh, with the architects of uh, of uh, historical monuments and heritage building um, was also uh, a big debate because they wanted to make a, a daytime image uh, at night and we never want to make a daytime image at night. And we had to prove that, uh, well, a lecture could be different at night and not the same that you see on the daytime. But um, if you are convincing enough and, and if you, the result is nice, well, at least you can try and make things and people uh, will accept it, you know, because the good thing about lighting, it doesn't last that much. When you make a project like that, it's maximum 20 years, 25 years. It's not going to be there for ages and centuries, so you can just make a try and, and, and do it, and then 20 years after, people will make something else, so there is no harm for, for the monument. We, we wait, made also projects um, on very weird uh, uh, building, like this waste plant. Uh, the idea was to, to bring a new um, positive uh, vision of this waste plant, but it's a huge, huge waste plant in the suburb of Paris. So they asked some architects to redo the facade and to renew it with a glass um, structure. And they asked us if we could do a kind of uh, 
event lighting, but that is a permanent installation and that people will look at it totally differently. And, and they will think that a waste plant is not as negative as it should be, but also it's a, it's a building that is very necessary in environmental issues and that people will look at it totally differently with a positive way. We did a lot of architectural lighting with dynamic lighting and uh, working with architects or working with directly with the client. Like in this case, there was a, a bank that asked us to make the lighting and we tried to convince the architect that we could do something interesting. We work on very different scale, very small one, very large one and huge one. And we always try to, to, to define a lighting that people will enjoy. In, like here, it's a, a path that was lighted with um, big projectors, 400 watt sodium projectors. And it's a path that the kids take every day going from high school to the center where they live. And uh, it was very, very uh, difficult to cross this path because it's inside a, a little forest and uh, they had to, to do that on winter and go back uh, at night and go in the morning at night and so the municipality asked us if it could be something different and we tried to, to propose something totally different. For the little story when we choose uh, the, the figures, the graphics of the sleeves, uh, everyone thought that this was marijuana <laughs> And it was not, <laughs> it was a prunus leaf. But well, they say, you sure it's a prunus? And say, yeah, yeah, it's a prunus. So they, they went on internet and they look at the prunus and say, but it's very close to marijuana. And they say, no, it's not. <laughs> but anyway, it doesn't matter, it was fun. <laughs> Um, we, we try to work as much as possible with architects from the very beginning. This is a project in Torino and it's a heat plant and uh, it's the middle of Torino and they wanted to hide this heat plant with a new construction and a new structure. And this is um, uh, stainless steel, polished as a mirror and we, we work with the architects to get the effects. Uh, the transparency with the lighting behind and also the reflection of the, um, of the public lighting with high pressure sodium. So all, all this mixed together and it was very important to work with the architect to define uh, the, the material, to define the polish of the material and all the structure and, and the rhythm. And if you want to achieve a project like that, you really need to work hand by hand and uh, develop things together. So. That was a very, very good uh, relationship that we constructed with him. And the daytime image has nothing to do with the nighttime image. And uh, sometimes it's very important to be totally in an opposite direction or in a very different direction. Here we, we also tried to create um, something hybrid. We wanted um, to have a classical illumination with the gold lighting and a very modern or contemporary illumination with the blue-green lighting. So we, we again use the lighting as paintings and uh, this is a dynamic lighting as well. And uh, we propose this idea of being hybrid, showing the monument in a way and showing also the monument in a different way. And because it's a museum, it's a very famous uh, ceramic uh, that is internationally known, ceramic of Sèvres. It's, um, well, we had the opportunity to treat this monument not as a classical lighting on a monument, but more on something uh, exploratory and innovative. And to finish with, now we're trying to use uh, LEDs uh, lighting making a filtration. We go back to filters. This will interest uh, lighting designer because we don't find good colors in two LEDs. We find always the same colors. There is two blue and one green and one red and one amber and they are very boring and very poor. When I started uh, working with LEDs in 2004, 2005, the manufacturers told us that we will have millions of colors and uh, we were so happy to hear that. And uh, we were very naive and, uh, well, we discovered that uh, was not the reality. So now we have five colors and amber color is uh, not in catalog, it's special. You have to order it like three months before if you want to get anything different. So we go back to filter. We take um, white LEDs or, or uh, red LEDs and we filter them with uh, glass, colored glass, and we, we again go 
to new colors and well we're losing a little light but doesn't matter for uh, architectural lighting because the idea is not to be efficient and uh, not as efficient as if it, if it is a public lighting and uh, well at least we can reach to get colors we want and we can also use again uh, the lighting uh, as a painting effect not as a wash or a very blurred effect but at least to to recreate the effect on uh, on a building the, the building is red on daytime it's an over red and uh, we transform this red into many many different colors purple and yellow and orange and and uh, pink and and so on and for sure we we for the setup each projector is specifically tuned on site and we don't have uh, a program or whatever we don't know exactly when we're going to do we do it on site and we we make the setup until we feel that we got what we want it's so it's difficult to work like that with a client because very often, as you all know, they ask for computer rendering and so on, and, and they say it's not the same. I say, no, for sure it's not the same. We decide to change because we, we thought that uh, the, in, in the real realization, it would be nicer to, to get that. So again, it's very difficult with all these new technologies, especially computer rendering, because in a way you're trapped into the rendering and many, many clients will ask you to be exactly like the rendering and I think it's uh, something we have to be aware of and we have to be uh, very uh, innovative in a way that we could propose if possible projects that are not visualized before and projects that you, you can do with improvisation and that you can do really on site. So this is a fight that uh, I think we will have to, to, to start because uh, uh, computer rendering is really something that uh, doesn't give you a lot of freedom in the end and it's a very very big problem so this was the introduction not too long I hope <laughs> and uh, well so I construct uh, the presentation going through diverse part of the world this is pictures from many many colleagues and lighting designer there is Motokoishi from Japan here and uh, here is Kai people from Scandinavia, and this is my, my neighbor on Christmas. I live just nearby, and uh, every Christmas he creates his own uh, fairy tale. <laughs> He's very imaginative. He's an 80 years old guy, and I try to take pictures every Christmas because it really is, is an amazing uh, creation every time. Sometimes kitsch, sometimes very modern. This year it was with uh, animals and uh, there was a beer, a white beer. And, uh, but I think this is light as well and uh, I think it's important. So this is also lighting. Uh, it's uh, how, and I will, I will show that also, how with a very, very bad lighting design you can really ruin uh, a building. This is um, a social house with the entrance and someone thought that it would be very nice to make these kind of things in front of the entrance but as you can see the lighting has not been thought in relation with the entrance and the door and uh, well it's, uh, it's an adventure when you want to go home every night. You know? Okay so and this is in Las Vegas and this is in uh, Shanghai and this is in Yemen but we will go all that through and what I, I want to, as I said, I want to discuss with you after is um, what is this search or this quest of identity? From the very beginning, I started, everyone was talking of could we reach to get a, a new night identity or could we get an iconic image that could be uh, the reflect of the identity of the city, of identity of uh, culture or... And, I don't think there is one answer, I think there is many, many answers and I think it's very interesting to, to discuss about it. So let's start with Europe, um, especially in France. We did this project uh, renewing a lighting plan that did not exist anymore. Um, there was um, the idea of having um, uh, a renewal of the public lighting, there was 52 luminous points, very few of them. and. Uh, we propose to keep this 52 luminous point and not to add any more 
luminous point, and we talk a lot with the people living there. There's 150 people living in this village, a very little village, and uh, at uh, summertime, because it's a very beautiful village, classified, um, uh, heritage classified. There is like 20,000 or 25,000 people every day coming through the village, but there is no hotel, no restaurant, no bar, so they cannot stay at night, and they, everyone goes, and only the people living there stay there. So we discuss with them and we try to create a lighting that will help them to find their doors and the way to get into the building, but to keep as much as possible darkness. Uh, for sure, the idea was to, to reduce the energy consumption and to change totally the atmosphere and the ambience and to get a better color rendering and to get a better atmosphere. Uh, I think talking of culture was interesting because they did not want anything like a theater or dramatic, dramatic approach. They really wanted something common, beautiful, but common. Um, we use only white light on the, on the project, uh, warm white light. Uh, at that period, there was no LEDs in neither, so we use a metal light with ceramic burner. And uh, we, we talk a lot with the people to decide where the lamp should be. And uh, the, every, every single lamp, there, on, there was only 52 lamps, every single lamp was installed according to uh, the, the authorization or at least the, the approval of the people living there. And I think it's a good way of working because uh, they're going to stay there for years and years and they're going to have this lighting and we will leave the village so at least we should have a total approval of the people about the lighting. And if they don't want the lighting, we don't put the lighting. If they want the lighting near the door, we put it near the door. It was not for us, like, uh, as designer, we have to decide for everyone else, and we know what we, we should do, and they don't know. So it was a very, very interesting project. We spent a lot of time on this project. We almost sponsor at the end, because uh, only 52 luminous point was not much. <laughs> and the fee was really very low. <laughs> but well, for us, it was again an adventure and a very human adventure and we decided to, to really um, put all our energy into it. So there is a, a lot of dark space into this village. Sometimes you have 100 meters without any lighting and um, because, well, you get used with the eye vision and um, the intensity is good enough and it's really clear, all the materials are clear so even if there is no lighting you see it very well. And, and it was a demonstration of how low you can be when you do a, a lighting project. Because as you can see, it's 35 watt only. And uh, it's only 52 luminous point for the whole village. So it's very, very low energy consumption. We did the same with um, the church. We had this church that is quite weird because it has been destroyed and one half of the church fall down into the river. And again, we, we transform the existing lighting that was with low pressure sodium. It was 600 watt lamps of low pressure sodium. We transform it to metal light and uh, discussing with uh, the people living there, we, we almost made the setup with them and then we, we finished the full installation and the full implementation. And they were very pleased with it. So, talking of culture, I think uh, for us was uh, a, a way of discovering what are the expectations of the people. Because sometimes you arrive as a lighting designer and you think uh, that you have a very, very nice and interesting idea and you are very creative and uh, that you think that this is the thing for this village and for these people. And well, if you don't discuss with them, sometimes you discover that it's not the reality and the truth. Sometimes they, they have another opinion. Sometimes they don't have any opinion because they don't have any culture about lighting. So what we try to do first is to make, uh, like here, lectures. We try to show different way of doing lighting to make to give them some culture, at least different than what they know because they knew only this lighting there. And after you do that, they try they start to express opinion, and uh, some people are f for the project, or some people are against. We change a project if they ask for, we propose different things, and, and I think it's a good way of building. It's easier to do that in a little village, for sure, because there is few people, it's easy to make meetings and to, 
to make a dialogue with them. When you are working on a huge city of two million people, it's more difficult. But I think the process is still the same because even in a very large and big city, you have small spaces, district, uh, centralities, and you can always find people into this, uh, these places that can express what they want and what they'd like. And, and uh, you can try to build with them uh, an answer or at least to, to propose an answer with them. Um, another project I wanted to show you because also it was a, a question of, um, of how project could react with the, with the demand of the people, the demand of the municipality first and the demand of the people. This was an avenue, it's a two kilometer long avenue that was built on a parking, you can see the parking here on two levels, underground parking, totally underground. <coughs> we, with the architect and landscape architect, we, we did the competition, we won it, and they opened the parkings in some places to get some natural light and to get um, a vision and the possibility of discovery of the, the natural space and the outdoor space. And uh, we work a lot on this uh, transition between the underground parking, the underground lighting, and the surface lighting. Uh, what we tried is first to use a white light to get as, as good color rendering as possible on the avenue and uh, on the parking as well. And uh, we proposed to, to make um, some, some lighting on the trees and the special spaces. And also what we, we proposed was to, to create relationship, visual relationship between each possibility of entrance into the parking, car entrance or pedestrian entrance, and to give a color code on each uh, main entrance that we call address. So there was one, two, three, four, five main entrance. Each one has a special color. This color could be found underground, and this color could be found on the space outside the entrance. And for us, it was important to create this relationship and also to uh, try to to create a lighting that will go from this important level underground because very often it's uh, 80 legs, 75 legs, 90 legs in the parking. And you go outside and you, you, you arrive on a pedestrian space where you have five legs, seven legs, 10 legs. So the contrast is very important and we wanted really to, to work on this contrast from the very beginning, the underground situation all the way to to the outside surface. And uh, this was a lot of work as well because um, we had to work with uh, the company in charge of the parking. Uh, it was not the same company that was working on the surface, so we have to make coordination. It was not the same architect, underground and outdoor. Well, a lot, a lot of problems, but uh, well, we, we succeed. Uh, we, we, keep colors as a color code. Some, some of them, as you can see here, very strong and very, uh, I would say, saturated colors because this was a theater entrance and you could come out of the parking and go straight right into the theater. So we wanted to get all this relationship. And again, we, we work a lot on the level of uh, lighting from the surface to the underground to really get it as smooth as possible and to get it as good as possible in terms of visual transition and comfort. So when you are on the surface, you can always can see where are the cars and the same from the cars, you can see where is the uh, outdoor space. And this is, this is really important during daytime for sure because it brings natural light, but during nighttime also because it really gives you a good understanding of the space. And I think if you get a good understanding of the space, you really reach what you, you should reach as a lighting designer. One of the most important things in this kind of projects is that people can understand the space at night. And if they understand the space at night, you're sure they will appreciate it. This is one of the big, big uh, square that we did with LEDs and, and water games. And, we had only one big, big mast like this one here, 18 meters high with projectors on it. And as you can see, with one big mast, we can get lighting for the wool thread. This is 100 meters from here to here, and it's uh, 70 meters from here to here. And this is the famous Cathedral of Chartres, which is in, uh, in Far Vision. 
So we try to freeze the space as much as possible because uh, there is a lot of events on this space. Uh, you can take off all the, the water games and people can walk on it. So the whole space will be used to, to make uh, whatever festival or music uh, scene or sometime on Sunday they can sell books, they come with books and they sell books in the space. So it was important that uh, into the project we, we free as much as possible the space is why we use this huge mast of 18 meters. And uh, as you can see, there is no any pole, no any vertical on the wall space, and it's almost 7,000 square meters. So it's a very big, big and large space. And one of the other projects I wanted to show you in, in Europe is the one we finished uh, recently. It's a very long project, one kilometer long. Uh, this was the existing situation with bowls. I'm sure you're familiar with bowls. <laughs> there was some in Melpignano yesterday. So. <laughs> so these balls have been invading the whole world <laughs> for ages. Maybe they came from outer space, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, because you find them everywhere in the world. And they polluting a lot. They, they give a lot of very bad lighting and, uh, well, they are cheap, but that's a good thing about it because uh, you cannot find any luminaire that is cheaper than a bowl. And they are, well, very simple to install. So, in, like in many, many places, the only lighting for this whole seafront, waterfront, that is one kilometer long. This is one of the most beautiful beach in, in France, in Sable d'Olonne. It's very, very large and beautiful beach. And you have all this ball all along here with uh, high pressure sodium, 250 watt. That makes a terrible lighting, really awful lighting. So there was a competition for renewing the wool, the wool uh, waterfront. And uh, again, we were integrated into one of the team and we won this project. So we, we proposed to, to take rid of the ball. That was the first proposal. <laughs> But they didn't want at the beginning. They say, oh, we like them. It's really, it's, very, it's, it's a sign of our own identity. I say, well, well it's no identity in a ball. I mean, you, you can find them everywhere in the world. So don't think this is a symbol of Sable d'Olonne. This is not a symbol at all. And uh, we propose to make high mast, 15 meters long. And uh, with projectors, we propose to have a white light and to get rid of the high pressure sodium. We had uh, a very large space between two masts. We reached uh, 42 meters between two masts, so it gave us the opportunity to freeze the vision towards the sea. We work a lot with the architect and the landscape architect on the ground and uh, on the, the choice of the material that should be clear enough to realize a very good, comfortable vision at night. And uh, we convinced the mayor to do these poles in wood. So all these poles are made with wood. And for us, it was important to have some material that would be very friendly and not uh, cold and during winter and too warm during summertime. So wood has this uh, a capacity and property to, to be very friendly. You can touch it even in winter or in summer and doesn't burn, doesn't get too cold. And um, we propose also to work on the vision of the beach. So on, there is a very uh, high tide and low tide uh, impact so you can see this is a waterfront and under the waterfront there is a lot of uh, a structure that can hold uh, little shops during the summer season and touristical season so we we also propose a new lighting for that that will be a lighting that could be kept even if the water was coming up so we propose special fixtures for that and we propose also that the mask could be seen from very far away with this help of uh, this uh, blue needle that could be seen from the sea and uh, that people will arrive from the sea like salesmen and fishermen and they will read the, um, the curve of the beach. For us it was important to work on very different scale. We very often work on, on this kind of approach. We work on a huge and large scale and, and we designed the project to answer and to fulfill the expectation of the very large scale. 
And then we work also on a very detailed scale and pedestrian scale and very human scale and we try to have universe totally different on a human scale that could be different from the far vision and the way we play with that is something we really enjoy in, in the studio and uh, we, we dedicate a lot of time to understand these sequences and reason and then it gives us the opportunity to make a lot of uh, diversity into the project because the human scale is really a closed vision it doesn't uh, bother on a far vision so you have a lot of diversity and possibilities even of colors of uh, tonalities or way of lighting and this doesn't make any difference on a far vision because you cannot perceive this little vision and you can really match and, and combine these two vision or this diverse vision so this is the result of the first phase so here you got all the existing lighting you can make the comparison with the balls, 250 watt sodium. And here is the new, new lighting because we made it in four years. We finished it now. The one kilometer is totally finished. So it was interesting to see the difference between our lighting with the beach lighted with the pedestrian site and also what would be the lighting here with the balls that totally hide the urban environment that create a lot of glare that doesn't light at all the ground because the ground is not lit, it's um, the sky that is lit mostly. And uh, you can see how our blue needle, even though they are very low consumption, they can be seen from very, very far away. And then we create all this little atmosphere, as I said, I will show it uh, with uh, closer details. We create different tunes of light, like this is uh, a 2007 Kelvin with a apricot filter. It's fluorescent lamp, it's not LEDs, but we wanted to create an apricot atmosphere on special square. We, we create very special and focused lighting on these little um, spaces that we call the lounges. And we create also special lighting on the stairways going down to the beach. And uh, we, we use a blue light to identify them and to signal them so people will know exactly. Because you can go down to the beach only every 400 meters or every... 300 meters, so it's important to signal it. Well, there was a lot of things that we had to understand and, and we, because there was no program at all, so we really need to build our own lighting design uh, accordingly to the organization of the space, of the users of the space. We had to understand how people will use the space on daytime, on nighttime, and we had to propose lighting that will fulfill this expectation. We also use a, uh, a range of uh, pedestrian poles uh, just to, to make a different animation of the space, not to regularly, there is sometimes no light and no poles, sometimes during 60, 70, 80 meters, it's no regular at all. The big masts are regular, but the small masts are not regular and they, they bring some animation and sequences as well. So this is some image from far away or in uh, car vision or pedestrian vision. It's only projectors. There is no functional lighting or street lighting luminaire. It's projectors, architectural projectors that we used to uh, light the space. We has, have only 10 lux on the ground and it's the same level of light if you are on a pedestrian path or on a street uh, line. But because the material is very different, uh, the pedestrian path is, the lumin luminancy is more stronger and it's more clear. And uh, so the space is really dedicated to pedestrian even visually. And the street lanes are darker and so you give um, uh, a predominancy on the pedestrian space with the same lighting and same level of light. And uh, you give no priority to the car visually at night. So this is the little lounges we created. The beach is illuminated and only until uh, midnight, and then the light is stopped. And we keep the lighting on, on the public space and on lounges as well. This is a pedestrian approach, and you can see there the balls all over. This is little spaces with dedicated lighting as well. And this is the stairways going down to the beaches with the bars and uh, 
Well, bars stay at night during summertime until midnight, sometimes one o'clock, and with music and and people dance on the beach, so it's nice. You should go to Sable Dolon. So this is a far vision. So you you see how the needle get an impact into the landscape and how they can be seen from very far away. And here you have the lighting of uh, the shops. And uh, we, we really low down the lighting as much as possible on, uh, on the facade. So, that was Europe. Uh, well, for sure, we are from Europe, at least everyone in my studio. <laughs> uh, talking of culture and background, I, I am from Algeria. I was born in Algeria, in North Africa. So very often people ask me what do I think in terms of identity and culture and I'm, I don't know what to answer because I arrived in France, I was nine years old. So in a way I feel French, like yesterday when France won the soccer, I was very happy. <laughs> but in another way, uh, I feel Mediterranean, you know, I, I really love to be in Italy, in Spain, in Greece, and in Turkey, and Morocco, and so I don't know what is my identity, even as a lighting designer, I don't know if in a way to translate the local uh, culture or the local needs or local uses. So in Europe it's more easy because um, the culture is, is quite uh, similar or at least no, no far, not so far from our own culture. And, but you will see in some of our projects, sometimes it's really very far away from our own culture and sometimes we have difficulty to understand what people want, especially when you are in very far countries like in China. So I think this is something, even after 26 years, I still don't understand. It's what is a part of what we bring with us as an identity. Is, is this part sometimes that is expected? Sometimes people would like you to help them to bring or to, to grow and to develop their own identity. And, and on the other way, part of their, their own identity you can put together and when you think of uh, um, uh, as I said but the lighting and lighting fixtures and lighting world is really getting international all these get uh, mixed and in trouble so I think it's very, is a very, very complex answer into that, and maybe today we can talk about what could be this kind of answer, if there is answers. Not one, but even many of them. So we work in Middle East, we had the chance to work in, in Jerusalem. Uh, one thing about uh, traveling is um, discovering different uh, landscape, different architecture, different stones, different material, different way of living, different many, many, many things. And um, for sure, when you arrive into a project like that, you try to get as much as possible. You, you try to understand where you are. You try to spend a lot of time. It took us a year and a half. To, to build this uh, lighting master plan. We work with some Israeli uh, architect and uh, landscape architect, and this is one of the best thing to do to work with local people because it helps you to go faster on a project because they can really share and, and bring their own culture and express it to you instead of uh, having you all this, always on the site trying to understand how things work. But this was a very difficult situation. I won't explain it because it's very complex, but as you know, Jerusalem is an um, occupied city, it's not recognized by international uh, authorities, uh, so we had to also deal with this situation with the Geneva Convention and it was very, very difficult to work there. But um, we were supposed to make a lighting master plan. We studied a lot uh, the daytime vision and the way the sun was going through the old city to understand the daytime image of the streets and the landscape at, at, at under the sun and the wall, because it's a walled city, and how this wall can take the light or be in shadow. We, we, for every single light semester plan we're doing now, we spend a lot of time on daytime vision and to understand the, how the sun runs and how the sun makes you 
possibilities to see the, the city or not from far vision or from cold vision. And I think it's very important because when you propose a night vision, you have to express it in, in um, order to make it very often different from the daytime vision, but sometimes also in relationship with the daytime vision. So it's a very important work, and I think it's uh, for us uh, uh, something we really need to do before having any proposal on nighttime vision. Because some facades are in the shadows all year long, some other are in the shadows at certain period of the day, some of them never see the sun, some of them are always under the sun, so Again, it's very important to understand all that and then propose uh, lighting and propose night vision and express it. Then we make analysis of what we call a nocturnal urban densities. Uh, this means that um, uh, we try to understand where there is lighting. All this is residential area. This is the old city. This is one kilometer long, so more or less is one, one, one kilometer. So it's a square of uh, one kilometer. And uh, you have all the residential area with the public space and street. And then you have a lot of spaces that are black on this picture that are without any lighting. Some of them are uh, green space or parks. Some of them, as you will see, are cemeteries because all this is cemeteries. And uh, they were lighted when we arrived. We proposed to make them into darkness, as you will see. So it's important to understand, even on an aerial vision, the, the balance and the repartition between light and dark. And then from this, you can build a project and start to, to build um, a new landscape at night. Oh, title has been... Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, it's called creating nightscape on two sides of the old city. So we propose to use lighting to, to show the, the topography and the relationship between the dry river. This is two dry river that are not with water anymore. And this is a crest of Mount Olives uh, that is very famous in Jerusalem. And we propose to use lighting to give relationship at night with the topography between the topography and the site because Jerusalem has been built on seven hills like Roma and uh, no one can understand these hills now and then we build the, the lighting with layers we use a wall uh, to, to reveal the morphology of the old city then we propose to use the, the architectural lighting to build up this image not to make a special project on each building, but in, in opposition to make each building into a holistic image, in, into a, a landscape image. And, and then it was not important at all to have a special uh, design for each building because the idea was really to unify and to harmonize every single lighting in order to create a wall and in order to, to make this vision possible. And then we propose also to, to use the trees and the vegetation and the landscape inside the old city to create this uh, image of uh, Jerusalem. <coughs> and as you can see, we propose to keep darkness all around the new image of the city and to keep all the cemeteries that are here around into the darkness. Here's the existing situation. You see all the symmetries are lighted. I don't know why we are lighting these symmetries. They put projectors on mast and uh, they really flood light all the symmetries. Um, for maybe it's to, well, I'll explain you the story. I'm not sure if you're very aware of this Christian um, and uh, religious approach of symmetries in Jerusalem. But it's interesting to understand the story because here, this gate here is called the Golden Gate. And uh, this is a gate we're supposed to pass through. It's totally closed with stones, stones that are two meters uh, thick. But this is the gate where the Messiah will arrive someday to cross the Golden Gate and lead all the dead people to paradise. So this is a story. And uh, everyone that was uh, rich enough or could be uh, rich enough to buy a tomb 
nearby the gate would be the first one to go through the Golden Gate behind the Mesha and go to the Paradise. And so there is thousands and thousands of tombs that are just spread all over the place, nearby the Golden Gate, and people think during their life that uh, if they have buried them, they will be the first one to, to follow the Messiah. So they have Muslim cemeteries, all here is Muslim cemeteries, then you have Christian cemeteries and then Jewish cemeteries with thousands and thousands and thousands of tombs and they decided to light them. I think the Messiah is clever enough to see in the dark. I don't know what you think, but uh, if he's not clever enough, well, we don't need any Mesha. I mean, if you cannot see, if you need a little lamp to go through. First, I don't know if we will arrive during night time. <laughs> Maybe we will arrive during daytime. And it doesn't need a lamp, I, I hope. Because if a God crossed a golden gate that is two meters thick without any tool, why should it need a lamp? But still, they decided to light all these cemeteries of people that will go uh, out of the tombs. I don't know how you say that in English. But, um, uh, they, will, they will be able to follow the mission. So this is a story where if you are uh, religious, you can believe into that. So we said, OK, let's put everything into darkness. Let's leave the tombs into darkness. Everything is clear, bright, and, and white, and you don't need any lighting. And, we really want this darkness to be uh, around our lighting wall, and um, that would be the best solution. So again, talking of culture and local um, stories, not to be offending, but uh, local believing, uh, that was a very difficult situation. Because at the very beginning of the study, they were talking about religious sign and how lighting could uh, translate or symbolize or visualize uh, all these religion aspects. And I didn't want to, to get lighting into that because I don't think lighting is a religious tool. I think lighting should be something to express ambience and landscape or architectural image or whatever, but not to, to stick to religion. And in addition to that, they don't agree at all. I mean, they all fight, as you all know, Muslims and Jewish and Christian in Jerusalem is a perpetual war. Uh, a real war and a religious war, everyone is fighting, like um, we have uh, five types of Christian there, we have Armenian and Greek Orthodox and Russian Orthodox and Syrian Orthodox Christians, so everyone has a different way of doing the cult and, and well, so we decided that we, we won't get into that, but lighting will not be an answer to this whole uh, religious approach. We ask to be totally free of, um, uh, in terms of uh, concept, and we, we achieve to get free on all this concept, and we propose to just stick on what lighting should be able to do, that means construct a landscape or construct a morphology image or construct something in relation with topography and architecture and history. But uh, you, you have to face that as a lighting designer when you work in these countries like that. And then uh, people say, you have been lighting uh, this mosque and not this one. And you have been lighting this synagogue and not this one. And why? And, uh, and they say, well, you cannot light everything. If not, you don't need us. I mean, if you decide to light every single building into Jerusalem, why well, you will make a lighting master plan? So all this is quite complicated and you have to be very diplomatic and uh, we had to, to also convince the Palestinian that this project will not be uh, a, a Israeli project or a governmental project uh, or just a project to make the city as beautiful as possible and so on and so on. So sometimes you try to get rid of, of that and we propose to, to new approach on the night ambiences. We propose new way of lighting um, the, the streets. That, that was not a design, but we thought that uh, we could launch uh, an international competition for designer. We made then uh, a special project during the lighting festival on a, on a square that called Muruston Square. They asked us to, to demonstrate what could be the lighting of the square. So that was the lighting 
before we started. This was again a hypersodium sodium with very bright luminaires, and this is a nice fountain and a nice square. We propose to use LEDs and to use two colors, a blue and gold one. And well, we realized a project, and um, we talk a lot with the shop owners around, and it's because it's a very commercial place with a lot of uh, restaurants and, uh, and uh, souvenir shops and so on. And, and we realized a project and um, we really wanted to integrate the people demands into it. So we decided the position of each luminaires according to the shop demands. So they will not be disturbing if they want to put seats or, or tables or whatever. Like here, for example, they have tables for, for restaurants and we did not put any lighting under the table because we didn't want to bother. The people eating there, so we had an asymmetrical image, but it doesn't matter if it's an asymmetrical image, it fulfills the expectation of the shop owners, it's good for us. And uh, well, the project was quite appreciated. This is a mosque that is behind, they use um, to, to make a fluorescent green lighting on the minaret, and uh, it's a very weird way of lighting a minaret, but. Um, it's still in the image and then as you can see during special event like the light festival or music festival there's a lot of people coming and uh, they enjoy the place and this is what lighting is for is for people enjoying the place and uh, not be disturbed by your crazy ideas or crazy project and be able to to really be there and uh, and this fruit of uh, the night uh, atmosphere then we did the project on the main entrance, what's called Jaffa Gate entrance, the west entrance, and this is David Citadel. This was a project with an architect. Uh, yeah, he had uh, uh, an order to renew totally the space, to take rid of the palm trees that are not very interesting and not uh, um, beautifying the wall of David Citadel. So we worked with him. We, we wanted to freeze the space again, to have only two group of poles, very high poles, and then to play on the facade and use the walls to light the space. We fight on the level of light. Again, this is very, uh, I would say, cultural. Um, the program was 60 lux on the ground here. Uh, we proposed 10 lux. <laughs> They, we fighted for six months on that. Uh, <laughs> well, fortunately enough, I, I should not say that, but uh, there was no one really uh, understanding what was 60 lux or 10 lux. I mean, that, that was just amazing because we were talking and talking with numbers and figures. And it was just a question of uh, I win and you lost, you know. So I said, okay, what, what do you want? Then we, it was like um, in, a, in a flea market. They said 60, we said 10, they said 45, we said 12. And uh, really, it was like that, you know, like buying a carpet. And at the end, because we were very stubborn, we, we ended with 15. So they wrote 15. And, uh, and I said, 15 uh, at the opening or 15 uh, depressed, depreciated? And uh, they look at me and say, what this guy is talking about? <laughs> so if you are a lighting designer, you know what is a depreciated level of flux. And I said, okay, let's say 15 lux at the beginning. <laughs> And they say, OK, we said 15 likes anyway. I say, OK, OK, no problem. <laughs> so now it's 10 likes and it's perfect. And uh, as you can see on the image, on night time, so this is daytime image. The, the stone is really, really white and really bright and takes uh, really with few light. So this is a space now. It's 10 likes average. Sometimes there is even zero likes, and we're very pleased with that. But because you can see the big wall that is 20 meters high, you don't need uh, to have more here. I mean, you can walk without any problem. There is no, no stairs, nothing. It's totally flat. There is no obstacles. And we have only this uh, group of poles and one behind uh, me when I take the picture. And all the facades are lit. This is the shops. We tried to maintain a very low level on the, on the shops, but that was a fight we lost. <laughs> Sometime you lost fights. And this is the second group of luminaires. So it's only 70 watt and 150, 140 because it's CPO lamp and uh, everything is the same rendering and same tonality of light. 
And as you can see, I mean, it's really dark and people really enjoy the space as it is. And no one ever make a, uh, a measurement. So sometimes you just discuss for nothing, you know, because uh, they don't know what is the level of light there. So. And this is all the shop. The, the architect designed all the new uh, canopies and uh, talk with them because you see the canopies are just chaotic and, uh, and really difficult to handle and some of them are really falling in peace so you redesign totally the canopy and as you can see it's really bright into the shots but they close at uh, 8 30 9 10 and then this is hotels so we we use some dedicated lighting on the hotels and some image very late in the night when there is no one walking into the street so, do we make a little pause? Yeah. Is it okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah? I mean, uh, how is the schedule? Is it fine for everyone? Or? Yeah. Because I still have 40 minutes or 35 minutes to go on. Okay. Okay, little pause okay. for cigarette. <laughs>